do a quick introduction. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Jock Breidweiser from bestofpr.com. Today's where you hear the best stories behind PR. Our guest today is Harold Burson, the founding chairman of Burson Marsteller, one of the world's leading and best known public relations and relations firms. Welcome, Harold. It's a pleasure and honor to speaking with you. Um, Good Harold, to be here. Thank you. Harold, I'm not sure if I even need to further introduce you because you're clearly a PR legend, but let me just say this. Um, You've been named the century's most influential PR figure by PR Week, and I think you have probably spent about 50 years practicing PR for corporate CEOs, government leaders, and heads of um, public sector institutions. It's really hard to imagine for I me mean, the number of stories and, and events that um, you have experienced during your professional career. And for today, I would just like you to please um, tell us your most memorable and favorite story about PR. Good. I'll be glad to do that. Most people associate me with working for large corporations. Uh, however, when I am asked, usually by college students, when I make my talks to various campus on various campuses during the year, uh, people ask me, "What is it in my professional career?" that I am proudest of having been a part of. And I surprised them by telling them that it really had nothing to do with a corporation. Rather, it had to do with an educational institution, uh, specifically uh, where I went to school, my alma mater, the University of Mississippi, known widely as Ole Miss. In September, 1977, excuse me, September 1997, I received a telephone call from the chancellor, a man named Robert Kayat, uh, who had been chancellor for a year. He was a person whom I had known for some years. Uh, he was an All-American football player at Ole Miss about 15 or 20 years after I graduated. Uh, he was uh, dean of the law school, and eventually became chancellor. And his conversation started this way. He said, Harold, you've got to help me get the Confederate flags out of the stadium. And I said, Robert, what have you been smoking? He said, I'm serious. And I said, I'm serious, too. You'll never get the flags out of the stadium. And he said, well, we've got to do it. And I said, well, why do we got to do it now? And he said, I'm going to be here for 10 more years, and I want my legacy to be that I brought a Phi Beta Kappa chapter to the Ole Miss campus. Ole Miss was then one of two state universities that did not have a Phi Beta Kappa chapter. And it seems that the process to obtain a Phi Beta Kappa chapter uh, consumed four years. During the first three years, uh, teams of academics, three or four of them, can come on campus at will, and they have total carte blanche to whom they talk, records they seek, what they, whatever they want to see, they can see. It seems that the first visit had already taken place, and it was on the weekend of a football game on the campus. And the word had come back that so long as there are Confederate flags in the stadium at Ole Miss, and so long as the band persists on playing Dixie so much, Ole Miss will not get a five beta kappa chapter. Right. So, I said, okay, I will come down and we'll talk about it. And I went to the campus, visited the campus with one of my associates, spent three days down there, and we talked with various representatives of the academic community, the administrators of the school, faculty, uh, student body leaders. Uh, and it seemed that 
everyone we spoke with uh, agreed that the flags should be out of the stadium. But no one was willing to take the lead in launching a movement to get them out. Uh, also, I might say that we did a rather thorough check on various metrics such as the percentage of black students uh, enrolled in the university and Ole Miss was as good as, if not better than most of the other southern public universities. Uh, they had black faculty members. Uh, the uh, student body had had two black presidents. Uh, the editor of the newspaper, uh, Miss Ole Miss, had representation of uh, African Americans. So they were doing very well from the standpoint of the enrollment and the accomplishments and recognition of black students. On my last day on the campus, I had lunch one-on-one -on -one with the football coach. Uh, he was new to the school. He had, had been there one year, had a so-so season. Uh, he did win his first two games uh, when I met with him. and I asked him what his attitude was toward the uh, flag. And he said, well, you know, I came from the Midwest. And he said, you know, I couldn't care less about the flags. Uh, they don't bother me. And I said, but do they affect the football program? And he said, well, of course they do. And I said, well, tell me how. And he said, very negatively. And I said, well, go through that rather slowly for me. He said, we're just not recruiting the best athletes in the state of Mississippi. And I said, well, tell me about that. And he said, of course, we know who the best athletes are in the state, both football and basketball in high school. And at the start of the season, our recruiters go visit their parents' home and talk to the students. And the parents are very delighted that their sons will be able to attend the state university. Uh, and we think that we're going to get them as uh, freshman football players next year. However, he said, when we come back six weeks later, we find out that they've already signed up with Florida, Tennessee, Georgia, Alabama, Florida, Florida State, and so forth and so on. And I said, well, how does that happen? And he said, it's very simple. He said, those other schools also are after these same players, and they come to visit the same homes, and the first thing they ask is, do you have either a VCR or a DVD player? <laughs> and with that, they bring out a tape or a disc, and it's the most recent football game on the Ole Miss campus. And all the people see are rebel flags, and all they hear is Dixie. And they ask the question, do you want your son to grow up in that kind of an environment in his college years? And of course, they have some doubts about that. And we are losing about 95% of those young men from Mississippi high schools. And he said, it's even worse in the basketball program. So I said to the coach, coach, you are the only person in the world who can get the flags out of the stadium. And he said, I'm not going to touch it with a 10-foot pole. He said, those alumni supporters, they would have my head if I did that, if I tried to do something like that. And I said, yes, Coach, but I think that those people, those rednecks as you call them, would rather have a winning football team than pay tribute to all the memorabilia of the Civil War. Uh, and he said, well, I'm not going to touch it. And so we parted. I went back to the chancellor and said, 
you are, you will never get the flags out of the stadium. But the coach can, and I related the story to him. And I said, if you want the flags out of the stadium, you've got to really work on him. Uh, in leaving the campus, I thought that if the coach had had a good season, he might come around for the next football season. Uh, and, and we had worked out a scenario with the administration and with the student government on how we would uh, go about removing the flags if the coach gave the word and told them that they'll never have a winning football team until they do get the flags out of the stadium. Uh, this became sort of a major issue because it leaked that I had visited the campus and that the chancellor was uh, intent on getting the flags out of the stadium. And literally, the chancellor got death threats uh, from some of the uh, very rabid partisan fans who uh, believe that the verbal flag should be there. About 10 days, two weeks before the end of the football season, I got a call from the coach, and he said, about those flags, what do you want me to do to try to get them out of the stadium? And I said, well, we want you to have a press conference. Also, we want you to send a letter to the editor of the school daily newspaper and tell them pretty much the story that you told me. And I said, we've got it written up, and I'll send it down to you. Also, if, if you're ready to cooperate with us, we'll send a couple of people down to coach you for a press conference. This was a Monday, and we scheduled a press conference for Thursday in which he told the same story that, that he told me. And Saturday, there was a football game on the campus, and we had all kinds of posters, please do not carry flags into the stadium and so forth and so on. Uh, also, uh, we wanted the flags out of the tailgate area, and there were posters all there. And we organized some groups of students who, if people had uh, flags on their tailgate uh, facilities, uh, they would be asked politely to take them off. Uh, there were three ugly incidents, none of which got reported in the paper. Uh, but in the stadium, the flags were reduced by at least 75%. The next week, there were hardly any flags in the stadium whatsoever. Uh, this came to me as really a great surprise, very pleasant surprise, that we were able to do it, accomplish that result so quickly, because professionally, it was really the quickest reaction in changing people's attitudes uh, on a very deep, serious issue that I had ever encountered. Here are people who had been steeped in Confederate memorabilia for more than 150 years, and they were willing to give them up if they could have a winning football team. The lesson that to be learned from that experience is if you have the right leverage or trade-off material and can use it deftly, you can gain almost any objective you want if it's a reasonable objective. And it's something that I thought would have taken years to do, but it was really accomplished over a single weekend. And that really is not only one of the outstanding public relations accomplishments in my career, but it's also, I think, the one that I'm proudest of. Well, that's a, that's a great story. I'll thank you so much for sharing. Truly inspiring story also, and especially with the backdrop of where, where the United stand, States stand, stand today. And uh, yeah, I think that's, that's absolutely a very forward-looking story, too. Good. Um, Good. I guess the, the, the follow-up question I would have for you is, um, did you actually become an honorary member of the Phi Beta Kappa chapter then? 
<laughs> no, they did get the Phi Beta Kappa chapter, but they I guess they looked at my grades, and they couldn't stretch them far enough to get me into Phi Beta Kappa. So I did, <laughs> I did not become an honorary member. <laughs> the, uh, uh, but it was it's really a proud moment. Uh, they did invite me to the installation ceremony. Uh, and, uh, of course, I still have very good relationships with the university. And the chancellor is retiring at the end of this June. So he accomplished his legacy. His legacy is intact. School has done marvelously under his uh, guidance. And, and with your help, obviously. Well, fan fantastic story again. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you sharing this story. And um, okay. best wishes to, to you and your business, obviously. And um, just. Uh, yeah, obviously you you still have a lot of things uh, cooking, and I hear you're still working in the office every day. Or well, most of the I, day. I'm in the office every day, and some people would question whether I'm really working. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt that's the case. That uh, people would actually question that. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. But you're very welcome. And uh, if you put that on a disc or something, uh, I appreciate you sending me one. I absolutely will send you a copy of that file. Thank okay, you. Okay, great. Thank, thank you so you much. Very, thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, Harold.